And welcome back to the of the Clear Jets podcast. Where it was Ben Blessington and Michael Nania. Michael, we've been talking about this for a while. Want to break down some of these veteran quarterback options. Uh, about a month and a half ago, we did a offensive coordinator candidate series where we would bring on somebody uh, onto the podcast to talk about a specific candidate, somebody who knows a hell of a lot more about these candidates than we did. Uh, and in that process, we brought on Marcus Johnson to talk about Greg Olson. Uh, and he was great. He gave us a lot of good uh, insight into Greg Olson. Obviously, the Jets went with Nathaniel Hackett. But I said to, to Marcus afterwards, I was like, you know what? We're probably going to need to do a Derek Carr podcast here at some point in the, uh, the near future. And today's the day, Marcus. So thank you so much for, for joining us. And uh, I mean, I, I really quickly, I guess I'll start with this. Derek Carr, I've seen mixed uh, reviews from Raiders fans. I've seen mm -hmm. Raiders fans who love him and defend him. Uh, and then I see Raiders fans who say that he's held the Raiders back, that he's never won a playoff game, that he can't win in cold weather. Uh, before we get into the specifics of Derek Carr as a player, where do you stand, you know, in terms of your opinion of, of Derek Carr right now? Uh, I mean, I, I think Derek Carr, he's coming off a, a, a very inconsistent season. Um, definitely, you know, there's some moments where he was below average. There's some some moments where he was above average. Uh, there wasn't a lot of moments where he was uh, very good. Let's say that. Um, but uh, he's just just average overall play. It just wasn't very special. Uh, anything he put on there on film, like it, it just definitely felt like he was uncomfortable in this offense. Uh, they, were, they weren't asking him to do a lot of things around his skill set. So, uh, I mean, definitely going into after last year, like definitely his value and the way his outlook as a player is a little bit down. But I think the the previous two years in 2021 and 2020 he played really well. Uh, he had a lot of great film, uh, a lot a lot of great plays, saw a lot of anticipation. So, you know, maybe it was the offense, Josh McDaniels or whatever. But, uh, I mean, definitely he's coming off an inconsistent season for sure. Yeah, and it's it's interesting to hear you bring up uh, Josh McDaniels in that offense uh, because Derek Carr's had plenty of different offensive coordinators in his career. Uh, he's had some great seasons and some mediocre seasons, uh, but the Jets brought in Todd Downing as their passing game coordinator, which I think uh, when the Jets brought in Nathaniel Hackett as the OC, everybody's like, all right, we're getting Rodgers, and then they brought in Downing as the passing game coordinator. It's like, all right, we're getting Carr. Uh, <laughs> I mean, what type of scheme do you think fits Derek Carr's skill set the best and given that Todd Downing is the passing game coordinator, do you think that is a, a match uh, made in heaven? Do you think that that was the type of system that, that fit him best? Uh, no, is it Todd Downing? Not really. I, I thought Todd Downing, uh, him and Todd Downing did not work. I don't think Todd Downing is very creative in the passing uh, game. Um, I, I don't know how much that's changed in Tennessee from the, some of the films I watched, you know, the past couple of years, it hasn't changed too much. So him being the passing game corner is interesting. Um, I mean, he did pretty well with AJ Brown, I believe. I mean, but who doesn't? So maybe you yeah. can see, you know, those guys out there. Um, I, I just, you know, maybe it's changed a little bit, but I didn't see too much creativity from him. It's a lot of the, uh, you know, the run game, the play action game, his play action game is pretty good though. I'll give him that. Uh, he still had Tannehill, playing pretty well in the play action game out there because Tannehill is a good play action quarterback and Derek Carr is a really good play action quarterback, to be honest. I mean, if you get him some play actions and get him going, I mean, uh, in 2021, there was a, a moment where I think he was the best play action passer with passer rating and everything. So uh, he is somebody that can really excel in that area. So, I mean, Todd Downing could work it out there, but um, I mean, in 2017, when he was here, Todd Downing, that was probably Derek Carr's worst your year of his career. So um, <laughs> and he has some pretty good players around there. Pretty good, pretty good offensive line. He did have a little bit of a broken back. I'll give him that. But uh, yeah, it, it, it wasn't, it wasn't, I wouldn't say it's a match made in heaven, him being uh, going back over there with Todd Downing, in my opinion. Yeah. And you just mentioned that being his worst season. So on that point, I mean, looking at the course of Derek Carr's career, it's, it's a really interesting arc to kind of look at because there isn't really an arc to it. I mean, that's an interesting word for me to choose because uh, it's been a really stable career, I think, compared to a lot of other quarterbacks. It doesn't have the ups and downs. I mean, there, there have definitely been ups and downs, but maybe not as severe as some other quarterbacks have. So looking at the course of his career, um, you mentioned that season with Downing in 2017 potentially being his worst. Uh, would you say that's his worst season? Which would you say is his best season? And overall, how would you say – he has changed as a player throughout his career. And um, what would you say about the so, sort of the stability that he's been able to achieve in his uh, career there? Uh, I think um, it's, it's hard for me on film I, from just being a film guy and a film right. perspective. I think his best film is 2021, 2021. He was, I thought he was 
about to be a, a solidified top 10 quarterback. That's what this year kind of shocked me a little bit um, because his film in 2021 was so good. Just he was so aggressive, man. Uh, I mean, he threw some picks, but I mean, there's some some dimes in there with his aggression and he was anticipating a lot of windows he never did and you know 2020 was a really good year in film too you start to saw saw that growth of him becoming that uh more not now i wouldn't say elite quarterback but like in the the, the tie tier twos like the Dak prescott's where matt ryan was in his prime basically that kind of upper echelon of player not not really like a elite quarterback you know you never saw that on tape but you saw the, the matt ryan's when he was like 30 years old winning mvp type of quarterback at that point but uh um I, I really I would say like his worst season though is 2017. Uh it's just terrible tape. Uh, uh I mean I think 2018 you see some bad tape there too, but it's just a bad team around him. The the rest of the time you just see a consistent quarterback though. You know you're gonna get with basically with Derek Carr, you know you're gonna get a top top 15 quarterback in most metrics, right? He's gonna be top 15. He might be 11 in some, he might be seven and one, he might be 14 in another. You're going to get top 15 in every metric. That's from QBR to EPA to touchdowns to yards, yards per game. It's all going to be top 15. So, I mean, that's kind of how you can see it as consistency. You know, you're going to get top 15 quarterback play from Derek Carr, no matter what. Um, so, uh, the, it, is it one week? It might be 25. One week, it might be five. Yes, but you're getting top 15 play quarterback play overall. Yeah, and I appreciate that at the beginning of your answer there, you mentioned how this is all film based, how you're looking at it. And that's that's what I try to do. I know Ben tries to as well, because we both know it's the best way to evaluate quarterbacks, evaluate any position. No, I think it's YouTube field. highlights. I'm pretty oh, sure, yeah. 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 Sure you, that's highlights. the film we're talking about. Yeah. Especially Twitter, the draft. Twitter applies Just to productions. That's what we're relying yes. on. But, uh, <laughs> but no, film is definitely the way to go. So we appreciate that. You're looking at it from that lens. And on that subject, um, looking at the course of his career, what would you say are some of the biggest disparities, I guess, in terms of what you're seeing really happening on the field through the film and what, the narratives and the, you know, some of the general stats may be I, the biggest differences between, you know, what the average Raiders fan may say about Derek Carr based on those box score stats, narratives, whatever, versus uh, what the film might show. Uh, I would say one thing is him missing receivers. I think that's a big thing. You know, it, it's just, I, I feel like he is the guy that everybody watches to see if somebody is missed. And, you know, a lot of quarterbacks on film miss guys, but we make sure we find every single one. Brian Baldinger does it. They're like everybody does it. Like even on the camera, on the TV, like you'll notice that if he goes to the Jets, you'll notice how those they'll be looking for, for missing guys with right. Derek Carr. Like it's, it's part of like the broadcast. And uh, I, I think it's a little bit of just, just a lot of quarterbacks do it. I feel like it's just pointed out with him a lot more. And I think it's kind of a, a narrative that, you know, it's kind of weird with him. Are you saying uh, like not seeing the receiver or inaccurate and missing him? No, there's not seeing them. Yeah. Like okay. Not seeing guys deep. I think that's a something right, that okay. he, he got, he, I mean, early in his career is from not anticipating basically. He's, he doesn't, he wasn't anticipating windows early in his career. So he would see things late. And if you're late, you're going to throw a pick. So he, then he would like check it down basically. Right. right. So uh, it, it, it's, it's like a, it's like a, um, it's a reputation thing. So when he does it and he misses somebody, it's like a big thing. It's like it'd be all over, like, oh, he's look, he's missing guys, type of thing. So uh, I, I think that's one of the narratives that is out there that I don't think really happens as often as people try to say it does. Let's say that. Um, but but uh, uh, other narratives, I mean, it, it, it's it's just hard with Derek because he's just so consistent. Top fifteen, it's like. Yeah, uh, it's, it's what do you like, right? I mean, it's it's is he like the, the flavor for every single for everybody? No, he's not going to be. I mean, there's gonna be some quirks you're not gonna like, and uh, some things that's gonna annoy you a little bit. But uh, I mean, it's just consistent top fifteen play. Yeah, and and one of the things you mentioned there in terms of you know him having that reputation for missing receivers, especially deep down the field, I feel like that's something that he kind of a reputation he sort of developed early in his career. I know he had that rookie year where. He's throwing for like five and a half yards an attempt or whatever it was. Yeah. It's made fun of for that a lot. So I, I feel like earlier on, he was known as kind of the check down quarterback, but you mentioned his 2021 tape, even 2020, he was slinging it, throwing it deep. So um, what sort of happened these past few years, especially those 2020, 21 seasons where he was, you know, slinging it more, throwing it deep. Um, what were some of the changes that led to him being more aggressive the past few seasons and which style do you think fits him better um, playing that more, you know, game manager, safe kind of role, or do you think he's best as an attacker down the field? 
I, I think the development of that was one was Henry Ruggs. I think Henry Ruggs coming in there. Um, I mean, you know, he made that idiotic, you know, move that he made, but um, he and Derek Carr had a great rapport and, you know, they're, they're about to be, a big, big play waiting to happen. I mean, in 2021, I think him and Derek were seven out of 12 on deep balls. And if you could just think about that, that means he's, they're over 50%. That he threw a deep ball to Henry Ruggs. Henry Ruggs is going to catch it. And, you know, they, they had that kind of rapport a little bit. And I, I think he just he just kept that aggressiveness. I mean, even into this season, I, I think that he, he had a high average depth of target this year. He still had that aggressiveness. I like him better as a player that way because um, j- just because, you know, you get bigger plays and explosive plays keep you in games. I mean, Devontae Adams had nine touchdowns over 25 yards this year. Uh, you know, it's it, they were still explosive. And I think he's going to still continue to be aggressive because I, I think, you know, one thing about Derek is, you know, some, sometimes the, the, the outside noise can get to him a little bit. I, I think that's one of his biggest flaws is, you know, not – not ignoring the noise right and i I think he hates that narrative i think he's gonna be fighting it so he's gonna continue to be aggressive i mean yeah with the better defense i think he can you know get away with getting some some of those turnovers that come with it but you know also you also have some guys that can get open that he can trust that he can try to test those windows so we'll see well it's interesting you mentioned uh the inability to not listen to the outsiders uh, and that noise because the next question I had for you is, do you think he can handle New York and this media market? Because it doesn't sound like it based on what you just said there. And if you, uh, if I hadn't already jumped off the Derek Carr ship when you were saying he uh, misses receivers so much that it's, it's noted on the broadcast, the fact that you're questioning whether or not he can handle New York and that that is, you know, if we've seen anything, if we learned anything about being a quarterback in New York over the last uh, few decades, it's imperative that you know how to, tune out the noise and to mm. handle the media and to not let yourself become a distraction because you will. <laughs> uh, yeah. Is that something that scares you if, if you're a Jets fan? So uh, I'll look at it two ways like this. I, I, I will say he doesn't ignore the noise, but he can handle the noise. So it's weird with Derek because I, the Raiders fans, he, they're, they're vicious, man. I mean, they're, they're pretty vicious. So I, I know Jets fans can be vicious, but Raiders fans, they can, they can come at you. I mean, when the last game at the Coliseum, he got booed and they were throwing stuff at him. So, um, you well, know, if, 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 he can, if he can handle that, I, I, he can handle it. It's, it's more to me is does he ignore it? Uh, that it's it's it, it so it goes two ways. So the press conference, he's not gonna have like a weird explosion at a press conference. He's not gonna have like a a moment that's gonna like embarrass everybody. Where, where he's gonna like, say why? that uh, that he wasn't <laughs> of, at fault for yeah. <laughs> throwing for eight yards in no. the game. No, no. I, actually, I think the media out there would probably like him just because he just because how he'll handle their questions, right? But I think ignoring it though, it, it bothering him leaving the podium is more. The, the the will he be able to handle it that way? Well, because you know it, you know he had the the UFC with Max Kellerman thing, and then e- even some of the things that I see, like you know even like you'll hear a bunch of noise about him not sharing targets or whatever, and then he'll come out the next game he's just sharing targets. It's kind of stuff like that to me. Right. Like so so he can handle the noise. That's that's not the problem for me. I, I think he can handle media pretty well. Um, I mean, the media, like the media was tough for him at the end, at the, his last couple of years, they were pretty hard on him. Uh, you know, they, they didn't really give him any, any chances, any excuses. So, um, yeah, uh, he'll be able to handle it. Will he ignore it, though? Yeah. Will it bother him on the just playing? Uh, I don't know about that. I'm, I'm not going to. Uh, it, it, it's going to be interesting with that if he goes over to New York for sure. Yeah, I, I've seen he has a knack for like blocking people on Twitter and, and you know, responding to stuff like that. And and I know what you're saying where it's like he can handle it. But the fact that any outside noise is is getting to him, uh, you know, that's a red flag to me. Yeah. Um, but in terms of the things that he does well, you know, I feel mm-hmm. like we focused a lot on the negative so far. Okay. Uh, let's talk about what he does well. You know, if, if you're uh, bringing in Derek Carr, what excites you? Uh, if you're a Jets fan, uh, I, like I said, it's just stability at the quarterback position. Um, I, um, I, I just, that's what I think about him. I, I think is he, he does, he is a starting NFL quarterback. He's not like, I, I think he's personally, I think he's better than Kirk cousins. Like I said, I still think he's a, a two tier two quarterback. Um, and I think that's what you guys, are, that's what a Jets fans would get. They would get a tier two quarterback who would come in there and play pretty well with some good weapons. He's a great distributor of the football. He can get guys the ball, especially in like in short passing game. You just got to avoid some his his mistakes, like his areas that he has weaknesses at. And, you know, 
there are some some weaknesses that can be glaring, but I think you can really coach around them. And I think that's a, what John Gruden did very well is coach around his skill set, because, you know, if you have a lot of the choice route guys that are uh, with New York, like, you know, Elijah Moores or, you know, Garrett Wilson, and you can mix it in and get, get him on some choice routes. And, you know, he's really good over the middle of the field. Uh, you know, he has a great, uh, a pretty good deep ball, too. I mean, if as long as you don't have him throw into his left deep all the time which josh mcdaniels did so it wasn't very good this year but if you make him throw a right deep a lot i mean he's gonna he's gonna do pretty well but uh uh I, that's that's what i think you get you get a guy who's he's a great distributor of the football and he's gonna get the ball to his playmakers he's gonna be able to get a lot of yak in a west coast offense so that's what i think he's gonna be able to do over there if if he uh if he came in and played an nfl quarterback for you for the new york jets what would you say are some of his best and worst routes on the field in terms of his accuracy targeting them you know just general stuff like whether it's an out or a hitch flats stuff like that because i saw some numbers from next gen stats that had him as one of the top guys in terms of completion percentage on out routes and flat routes those are the two things he was the best at so do you think that matches up with the film and then what would you say are some of the routes that he might struggle with a little bit more uh, I would say his best route is slant routes. I think he's a great slant okay. thrower. Um, I mean, that, that's one of the, one of the things he excelled at, um, you know, and anything, you know, super quick. So like a quick out, as I was talking about the choice route, the choice, choice route looks he used to run with Henry Runfro and Darren Waller. They used to eat on those. I think him and Darren Waller were the best choice, choice route quarterback tight end receiver that in the league, in my opinion, because they were just so innate and they, they were just kind of just, feel each other and you know whatever they wanted to do right and that's and he was so good on that and great timing and always accurate on those quick outs those quick slants and you know even those hitch routes and i think he's he's accurate to the middle of the field deep too uh like throwing some you know some post routes he can be hit and miss on post routes i think but you know i think he's, he's pretty accurate throwing deep on some deep seams and stuff like that that's something that he does really well hitting tight ends on the seam that's something he did a lot with darren waller too right hitting those windows and uh uh, but out routes is just like I said, it depends on where it is because like 15 yard out routes is not very good. You know, it, it's not something you, you like to see e even like a 15 yard comebacks to outside the numbers. That's where he struggles. He struggles to throw outside the numbers intermediate. Um, and, you know, of course, that's what Josh McDaniels did all year. So, you know, the Raiders struggled, but <laughs> like John Gruden avoided that altogether. And I, that's what I think it, if you want to coach around his skill set. Right. You kind of kind of avoid some of those areas like he could hit him every once in a while. But we're talking about consistency here. If you're throwing it 25 percent of the time. Yeah. And he's going to hit those 52 percent completion percentage at those areas. And it's not going to be clean and you can't have that. So you, you got to keep it to a minimum intermediate, I believe, outside the numbers. But um, the slant routes are, are his best routes. But if you start throwing it intermediate outside the numbers, it's not going to work. What do you think of his anticipation? Because I was watching some games, uh, mostly from this season, uh, so maybe it changed throughout his career. But um, I was looking at some of his games this year, and one of the weaknesses I noted down for him was that sometimes I feel like there are a few throws where I saw him wait until the guy was open to until he started throwing it versus, you know, maybe there was an opportunity to anticipate that throw, get mm -hmm. it there with a little bit more room towards the sideline specifically on some of those sideline throws like you're talking about in the intermediate range. So what do you think of his anticipation overall? I mean, this year it was non-existent, man. It was really disappointing for me. I, it, it was, it, I don't know what happened. It just kind of just faded away. I don't know. Maybe he was thinking too much in his offense. He was trying to make sure he was right in the offense, but I mean, there's a lot of moments where he was just late, man. I mean, he was late all year. It was, it was just kind of just what kind of made him, struggle in my opinion was he was not anticipating because in 2021 man that's all he did and you know he was throwing into that's how he was throwing all these tight window throws they were so explosive in 2021 because he was anticipating like crazy and, and he was hitting windows throwing the ball on time you know it, it was pretty fun to watch to him throw in 2021 but 2022 was just totally different man it was it, it felt like it was missing a little bit and you, you you wonder if it was just the offense, you know, or if he goes over the, to a, the wet back to the West coast and understands those concepts, he's going to be able to anticipate because he knows those concepts. So I don't know. It's, it's interesting with him that that was something that he struggled with before, but I thought he took the next step in uh, from, from 2020 and 2021, but it went back to 2022. So who knows, man, it, it's, it's kind of up and down there. Who knows you're going to get in 2023 with it because it was totally gone last year. 
Uh, are there specific types of defenses and schemes that he excels or struggles against, or would you say it's it's pretty even uh, across the board? Uh, uh, I mean, a lot of the uh, I would say a lot of cover two he doesn't play uh, very well against. I, I think sometimes in in cover two, you know, he can get into the right thing a little bit, uh, but uh, most of the time he does okay there. I, I would say like a lot of the cover seven coverages. Uh, sometimes he can have a little bit of struggle there a little bit, um, mostly because he doesn't use his legs like you would want him to. I think with some of those coverages when they're, you know, they, they got their backs turned, he's got to use his athleticism a little bit more and kind of make plays outside of the pocket instead of trying to find something inside those windows, because sometimes he can sit in the pocket a little bit too long and things like that with some of the too high coverages, if they're really good teams, right? Because uh, in 2021, they're, they're playing single high against them a lot of early on. He was killing them, right? And they started, started playing a lot of too high. And that went into this year, playing a lot of too high. So um, it, it, those those are some of the coverages that he, he kind of has some issues with, in my opinion. It, I mean, quarters he does pretty good against, but mostly it's cover two and a lot of like the cover seven man match coverages. A lot of when they're, they're showing him one thing, showing something different, a lot of, a lot of diagnosing things uh, post snap. You know, he's not the greatest at, I would say. So uh, I, I would say it was, it was a lot of those, you know, disguising too high coverages. But he's seeing a lot of that because he's he got his respect back playing pretty well going into 2022. Yeah, and I think the thing that is intriguing about that is if Brees Hall comes back and healthy, and obviously I know the Raiders have Josh Jacobs, but if Brees, if Brees Hall's back and healthy uh, and running the way he was uh, as a rookie – I think teams are going to be forced to stack the box a little bit more and he's going to face those single high looks. And that's where you really could see that, that PA, uh, you know, vertical shot offense really work for him. I think that is something that Derek Carr could really excel at is, is running that play action game and taking the deep shots, um, but not having to have too much on his plate. How do you feel like he would, would fare, you know, similar to the role that Jimmy Garoppolo has played in, in San Francisco or Ryan Tannehill in Tennessee, you know, he's Derek Carr's never had a even a competent defense his entire mm -hmm. career. If he's able to go to a spot that has a great defense and then has, you know, the insulation on offense of a good running game and that he's not going to have to carry it, is that the ideal role for Derek Carr? You know, in other words, is that can the Jets beat the AFC's best with that type of uh, combination? Yeah, yeah. To be honest, I think so. Um, I think Derek Carr, um, just because the consistency that he brings from just week to week, um, you know, it's, it's, it's good enough. Right. And that's kind of the consistency that he brings. So if you have a good defense that can get through his duds, cause I think there's going to be some dud games, right. Uh, they got more limp. They, they've gotten more limited as his career has gone along, but there will be some dud games that he has. It's just going to happen where he just kind of just can't hit anything. But if you have a defense that can keep you him in the game, he's, he's a very clutch quarterback. Right. And I think that's one thing that, you know, we didn't see that much this year. You still saw a little bit of it. I guess he I mean, he would have to break the record for the Raiders to make the quarterback to make the playoffs. I mean, to uh, break the comeback record to make the playoffs. If, you know, he he, ex he executed every single time he had a comeback. I think he still had four, in my opinion. But that's one thing with him is that he in the fourth quarter with two minutes left and you need a score. Derek Carr is clutch man. Uh, you, everything that we talk about goes away. You know, he starts anticipating for some reason. He starts moving in the pocket. He starts breaking tackles in the pocket. It's it's weird. So um, if you have that defense that can keep him in the game, for the most part, and you can get him to that point where it's two minutes left and you got some guys that can make some plays for him too. Because, I mean, this past year, I mean, they should have beat the Chiefs. I mean, if Devontae Adams gets his hand <laughs> down, gets his feet down. I still can't, I still can't figure out how he, he didn't get his feet down there. So, you know, it's it's – it's that too, like how clutch he is. I mean, I think he has like 33 comebacks, something crazy, the most in yeah. like the, this, this lifespan of, you know, for, in somebody's first nine years or whatever. Yeah, that's when Derek Carr will bring you home. And I think that's kind of the difference maker, uh, I would say he is when it comes to playing the quarterback position. Yeah, I think Jets fans would definitely welcome that because it's something they haven't really had, you know, quarterbacks they could trust to make these comebacks at the end of games. Usually it's the other way around. Even with some of the Jets' good defenses, they've been the victim of more comebacks uh, than they've made themselves. So it would be good to have that. But one thing that I think a lot of Jets fans are concerned about as it pertains to Carr with the Jets specifically, um, that he wouldn't have to deal with on the Saints, on the Panthers, some of these other contenders, uh, is the cold weather. It's one thing that a lot of people bring up. And 
I was looking at these numbers a few days ago, and I do know it's uh, there are a lot of really good teams in that sample of cold games that he's played. Um, obviously they're all on the road. So, uh, yeah. so it's an interesting data sample. It's not uh, a thing that you could read into too much, but at the same time, it is a, a very rough set of, you know, win loss record and numbers that he has in those cold weather games. So from your experience watching those games, how much of that is him actually responding to that cold weather and how much of it is, you know, just noise in a set of games against really good teams. Uh, I, I, th- I think it goes a couple ways. I think one, the Raiders are a West Coast team, okay? So the, the Raiders do not travel well. I think that's one thing. He gets a lot of bad credit for that, but the Raiders have never traveled well to the East Coast. It's, like, never been a thing where that team goes to the East Coast in the cold and just dominates, right? I mean, the Tuck rule is a great example. They, I mean, they <laughs> they should have beat that Patriots team, but they went into the snow, and they're one of the best offices in the league, and you know, they could only put up, like, 13 points, right? Um, so, but – Back to Derek Carr, I think he does struggle in the cold, right? I think that's one thing that happens to him. I, I don't know if he, like, the way he puts touching the ball, kind of the ball just flutters on him a little bit. His accuracy is just really bad in the cold. You could just tell, just like the Steelers game, you know, his last throw as a Raider is really bad, right? Um, but he had some bad throws earlier in that game. Um, and, and I think the, the one game that I remember that he played pretty well um, going into, like, Cleveland, I think, you know, it was under 40 degrees. It was really windy outside. I mean, he was actually, you know, got a part of the run game a little bit. You said he ran the ball a lot more. Um, you know, John Gruden didn't really try to make him throw too much. So when you play in those cold weather games, I, I think you just kind of can't lean on Derek Carr to throw the ball 45 times and, you know, and throw it through the wind and, and do those type of things. I think you have to have a good game plan for him and to try, try to get through that weather. Uh, Cause that, that's kind of pissed me off about the Steelers game this past, this past year. I mean, they're up 10 to three, this got an interception, they're up to 40 yard line and, you know, Derek Carr, he already threw the ball over Devonte Adams head on an easy hitch route, right? Uh, you run the ball, you know, um, you know, I don't think Robert Sala is going to be like Josh McDaniels and I don't know, he's going to put Derek Carr on a tryout. Like I felt like that game was so <laughs> just, you know, you just hand the ball to Brees Hall, right? It's uh, you're up 10 to three. <laughs> you're under <That>, 40. <laughs> that's pretty much the Zach Wilson offense from last year. Yeah. So, you know, if, if, if it's, if it's cold and you know, you feel him, he's not having a good day and you're winning. Yeah. You, you don't want to put the ball in his hands to try to get that done. But he's won a, he's won a couple games in the cold, I believe, but uh, most of them are against the chiefs. Let's just say that. I think one of the things that is appealing about Derek Carr in contrast to Aaron Rodgers is the idea that, you know, you could have him for the next four or five, six years. He's only 31. And as we've seen quarterbacks play up until they're 40. Um, But at the very least, you know, you probably you have four or five years of of Derek Carr still in his prime. How much room for growth do you think there is with with a guy like that? I mean, obviously, he's probably a finished product but yeah. like you said after 2021 you kind of thought he might be able to cement himself as a top 10 quarterback in this league they change offenses they go to josh mcdaniels you know is it possible that he gets to new york you know i know you said he didn't have great success with downing uh, as oc mm-hmm. but when downing was the qb coach for him you know that is when he had his best year or one of his best years in 2016 yeah uh right. you know do you feel like you, you see the uh, the career renaissance, or maybe not renaissance, but you know, like you see with Matthew Stafford going to LA? He was always successful in Detroit, but he goes to LA and he puts up video game numbers with McVay and Cup and wins a Super Bowl. Do you see that type of of trajectory on the table for Carr? Or is he kind of who he is? He's always going to be the twelfth, thirteenth, fourteenth, fifteenth quarterback, and you know what you're getting. Uh, I think I think he could be a go get back to where I thought he was going to be. I, I really do. Um, he just he just has to kind of you know be able to just kind of relax and not have to worry about just throwing the ball to Devontae Adams, right? He had, he had to get the ball to Devontae Adams, or you know they're, they're going to put him on the TV or whatever, right? Uh, yeah. He's not going to worry about that in New York. He could just throw the ball to whoever the hell he wants to throw the ball to, right? Whoever's open. He's not to worry about some of those other things that he had to worry about this past past year, in my opinion. Um, he's going to be more relaxed he's, he's probably gonna feel you know he's gonna prove himself right i think he, motivation is something big for Derek carr you know i think john Gruden used to troll him a lot he brought in like he brought in marcus mariota he used to he looked at all uh, Kyler murray looked at dwayne haskins always had somebody behind Derek carr to replace him and i think Derek carr played well with that motivation so i think he's that's the big thing with me is that he's going to be motivated right he's going to want to show josh mcdaniels they made a mistake he's going to want to prove everybody wrong 
uh, over in Las Vegas. So I think that's kind of the big thing when he comes in there is that he's going to be motivated, man. He's going to be angry. And angry Derek Carr is is what you like. Uh, we got happy Derek Carr a little bit this year. Uh, I, I make a joke on tape, don't lie, about uh, in 2021, he wasn't smiling in his uh, his pro football reference picture. And this year he was. So I if <laughs> I don't think he'll be smiling this year. So, uh, you know, you, you want angry Derek Carr to come in there and play motivated and with something to prove, in my opinion. I mean, I, I think – well, that, that's a great point. We're going to keep an eye out for that when the uh, the team photo comes of Derek. Yeah, Zach Wilson here. probably is the biggest smile in the league on his pro football <laughs> reference true. picture. So there's definitely a correlation with that. You should chart yeah. that, Michael. I think we might be able to find a correlation. <laughs> I think uh, every time, you know, as a Jets fan, it's been so long since we've seen the team in the playoffs. So every January I'm, I'm watching playoff football, and the things that stand out – the number one thing that stands out to pretty much everybody is – you got to have a great quarterback. Yeah, you can get by if you have a great defense and you can, you know, be a great, well-built team and and make a run. But if you're going to win the Super Bowl, if you're going to go all the way, you see those 35-38 shootouts like we just saw in the Super Bowl and you see quarterbacks just, you know, like heavyweight boxing haymakers back and forth and back and forth and in the AFC in the playoff race, you're going to have to go up against Burrow and Allen and and Herbert and Trevor Lawrence and uh, you know, I don't, Lamar Jackson, uh, I've left Mahomes out there. Um, yeah. just a lot of heavy hitters. Mm -hmm. Do you think Carr, you know, I know he's not as, uh, you know, he's not at that level, but at his peaks, we've seen him go toe to toe with Patrick Mahomes. We've seen him, you know, go to toe, toe to toe with Joe Burrow in the playoffs. Do you feel, uh, like that is a selling point with Derek Carr or do you think that's a, something to criticize him over? It? Uh, I was, I would say he makes you competitive against them. Right. Um, I think he does he like get you over the top of them for sure. No, I think he makes you competitive. Right. I, I, like against the Chargers. I mean, he, he did pretty well against Justin Herbert when he finished the game and it was Derek Carver, Justin Herbert. And he didn't get hurt. The one game he got hurt. He was three and two against him. So he had a winning record against Justin Herbert. Right. Um, you know, Patrick Mahomes. You know, the, the Chiefs, just, they, just, they just own the Raiders. And, they, you know, the Raiders beat them once and they circled the wagons with the van, with the bus. And it, it's been a disaster since then. So, um, you know, it, it's a little different with Patrick Mahomes. But, you know, he you know he went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Joe Burrow in the playoffs. I mean, he couldn't get it done. Uh, but, you know, they, they let it come back. They were down 26, man, and they made that a game. Uh he's going to make you competitive against those guys for sure. It's, it's, that's kind of the, the, um, what I would say what he brings is he does make you competitive against those top echelon quarterbacks, right? It's, it's, it's not that he's going to, he's, he might have a game that he outplays those guys, right? If, if he comes out and he plays his a game, that game, and that's possible that that can happen. And I've seen it happen. Uh, so um, he makes you competitive in the AFC for sure. That's, that's, one thing he does coming in right away. Yeah. And I was thinking about this recently in terms of, you know, what level of quarterback do you need to win a championship? But I feel like they're those middle ground quarterbacks just haven't really gotten the chance to show it. It feels like there have been obviously plenty of top quarterbacks who win and get there every year, but we've also seen some of these random seasons where, you know, we had a couple with the jets where Mark Sanchez is in the AFC championship. Blake Bortles got there. Nick Foles won a super bowl. But then you have guys like Carr and Kirk Cousins, some and you know Stafford for most of his career before he got to the Rams. Uh, some of those guys, like if you put them on those early Jets teams or the 2017 Jaguars, you could easily picture them winning the Super Bowl with those teams, but mm -hmm. they just haven't gotten those chances. So I feel like the potential for these quarterbacks to win Super Bowls, you know, these tier two quarterbacks like you put Carr in, um, they can win Super Bowls. I just feel like there's been this weird thing going on in recent years where their teams just haven't gotten them to that point and part of that is them but then you just look at guys like you know like i mentioned bortles like case keenum got to an nfc championship some of these guys have somehow gotten that far yeah. um so um like you said do you think if the jets make the playoffs because i think they're a playoff team with Carr, um how many like let's say the jets can make the playoffs four years in a row with their car what do you think the odds are of him just having out of those four years that one run where it just all clicks and he can get them to where they want to go to the Super Bowl? Yeah, it, it, it all it's, to me with how clutch he is is always possible. Because um, to me, to win a Super Bowl, you just need a good quarterback that's clutch with with a great team, right? You have an elite team and you have a good quarterback that's clutch. 
I mean, that's what the Rams had. They have Matthew Stafford. That's, that was Matthew Stafford's coward card is the same as Derek Carr's calling card. He is clutch. And that's what you saw in the playoffs with him. When they needed a throw and it was late and it was big time, he made that throw. And, you know, Derek, Derek Carr's been doing that his whole career for the Raiders. You know, a lot of Raiders fans, though, they don't like to hear that. But, but they were they were begging for it this year, right? That's the time they missed it. The one year it didn't happen, they were begging for it. So, um, but he, he's made big throws. He he kept it from drafting Nick Bosa. He's so clutch against the Cardinals a couple years ago. I was live at that game because I live in Arizona. And uh, he, uh, <laughs> he he kept it from getting Nick Bosa and having a higher draft pick because he was so clutch. So it's just, it, he just makes throws at the you know when they when you need them sometimes he just makes that throw um when it's a close game like some when you're getting blown out will he always make you uh, bring you back like down 24 3 you know maybe not but like if it's if it's 24 17 and there's two minutes left and you get the ball like there's a pretty damn good chance that Derek Carr's gonna go down there and he's gonna score right yeah. Jets fans are, are pretty familiar with uh with his clutchness considering he almost handed us Trevor Lawrence <laughs> Until uh, we had to crumble that bag. But I remember it. I will that, say that's I, still one of my all time loudest cheers as a Jets fan. In hindsight, it's pretty embarrassing. But at the moment, it was a triumphant moment. I think part of the reason I'm hesitant on Carr is I remember before that, like, I'd already turned the TV off and then. Uh, then somehow the, the Raiders got the ball back and then the Jets sent the zero blitz and whatever. We know what happens. Yeah. But the possession before that, where I was really like, all right, come on, Raiders, go ahead and win this game. And Derek Carr just kind of threw the game away. And I just remember I was just livid. I was like, this guy's a bum. What yeah. a mid quarterback. You know, and I was, so I think I, that's still in the back of my head. And then, he, of course, he came back and won the game. But yeah, you know, without Greg Williams, maybe he doesn't. Um, we, have, we have 10 categories here, Marcus. Okay. Uh, okay. I want you to grade them on a scale of one to 10. On each of these, okay, so a total okay. score of 100. We'll see. Let's do it. Um, let's start with uh, with arm strength. One to ten. Ten being Mahomes, Allen. You know, one being 2016 Ryan Fitzpatrick. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Somewhere in there. I want to say nine. Okay. All right, nine. All right. Uh, pre-snap processing. Ooh, ten. Ten. Okay. Yeah. Like that. Uh, what about post snap processing? Seven point five. Seven point five. There's Can a difference. Can I ask there. you quickly on that because, yeah. like, that's that's kind of something that does line up with what I think I was noticing watching his film this year. Because I feel yeah. like pre snap, he's really good at. You know, if there's going to be a matchup that's open right away, like the tight end's going to sit down, he's going to be open. He will find that quickly. But when that when that isn't open, sometimes going through the progressions, there could be a little bit. Uh, of trouble there so do you kind of see that do you feel like it's i mean obviously in your grades it backs that up but uh, you feel yeah. like the pre-snap is better than post oh oh for sure uh pre-snap he's so good I, like the offensive line wherever he's gonna go is gonna be better than what they actually are so you know this past year the Raiders office line was not good but people believed that they were and a lot of that is because of Derek Carr he's so good pre-snap he gets the right protections in he'll get you in the right spot he sees blitzes probably like just as good as anybody in the league he sees blitzes um that's why he's so good against it the teams don't blitz him that much uh you know the teams that do they get burned because he can see those things and he can point them out and if he has a good running back and a great center oh it's it's over for you if you see in those blitzes it's just afterwards you can confuse him a little bit better sometimes he doesn't see the field like always how you want him to see the field at times so that's why i say it's more of a 7.5 um because i mean to be honest i mean before like 2020 and 2021 it's probably like a six so it's gotten better but it's still not perfect or it's still not like an eight or a nine in my opinion I want to keep going with the grades, but just because you, you bring it up again, the, the not seeing receivers thing, where do you think that that comes from? When I watched him, one of the things I noticed was, you know, he's looking for the deep shot and then he checks it down. He looks for the deep shot and then he checks it down. And and it's honestly, it works. I mean, uh, mm. but if you're able to play that too high shell or if your corners are locking down the deep shots and, you know, you have good linebackers and safeties and pass coverage, you can take away those check downs and you're kind of force him to kind of get to that second and that third read. That's where I think you saw some mistakes, especially in that that Steelers game. Yeah, uh, that I watched. But is is that where it's coming from? Just the the look for the the deep shot and then go to the check down, and he misses. You know, the third option on the play who might be open for for twenty yards, or is it just you know uh, not uh, seeing the field well? So so it, it goes back to two things. So uh, it's lack of anticipation. So he he's not anticipating those windows to hit him. Right. Yeah. A lot of those are anticipation throws and he's late. And then if he's you're late, then any the bad things can happen. He's a smart guy, so he knows that. So he knows when he's late, he checks it down. The other thing is that he did not trust that offensive line last year. 
um, uh, he was trying to, it, it, he know he knew that he couldn't hold the ball for three seconds, right? If he if he held the ball for three seconds, he's getting hit. That was kind of the thing. Right. So you know, a lot of these metrics that we have out here these days, I mean, they're, they're like two and a half seconds or a little bit after two and a half. I mean, if he if he hit three seconds with the ball in his hand, he was getting hit last year. So uh, a lot of that had to do with him. Some of those, especially the Steelers game, man. Uh, I mean, that was kind of the worst one for that. Uh, last season where you, you saw him not be aggressive that much. And maybe, I don't know if that's him playing in the cold. I'm not sure about that, but um, I, I would say like the, the previous two years, it was definitely overblown a little bit. I would even say that, uh, like last year was a little overblown a little bit, but I mean, there is times that it happens. It is times that it's there and you know, you, you, it's not always a bad thing to check down, but sometimes you want him to be more aggressive. All right, let's keep, let's keep going with the grades. Uh, short okay. accuracy, short accuracy, uh, 10. Yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, what about medium accuracy? Middle of the field, those out routes, um, 15 six. yards, 26? Six. six, yeah. Now, is it different, uh, would you say, uh, throwing over the, the middle versus outside the numbers? Do you outside feel the, he... It's totally different, yes. Uh huh. So outside, middle of the numbers, I would probably say nine. It's the outside the numbers, so it would probably be like a four or five, to be honest. So you don't like the yeah, We can split numbers. those up so we can do like medium – Outside and medium. Well, now we're going to have 11 categories. You know, it's it going to be 10 uh, for 100. It's going to be nice and easy. We have a calculator, though. <laughs> okay. No, God. All right, you're the math guy. You can handle that. Um, all right, are you actually adding another? Oh, he's adding another category. I'm adding it in. So okay. we had, uh, you said four for outside medium and yeah. nine over the middle? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Michael, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like Marcus has said a few things about Derek Carr that don't seem to gel with the type of offense that they they're planning to run. And we don't necessarily know exactly what Nathaniel Hackett and Todd Downing and Keith Carter's offense will look like, mm -hmm. but assuming it's a West coast offense, assuming it's somewhat similar to the offense that ran last year, it seems like timing and anticipation might be the most important thing. Yeah. Uh, and then being able to throw outside the numbers as a quarterback, you know, I, I guess the Jets run a lot of crossing routes uh, or, you know, I guess Nathaniel Hackett ran a lot of crossing routes in, in Green Bay with Aaron Rodgers. So I guess that's fine over the middle, but it seems like lack of anticipation and struggling throwing outside the numbers, you know, and missing open guy. It, it seems like there's some red flags here that, that might be uh, sounding off some alarms. Is that just me or. Uh, well, well, I'll say this. I'll say this in the West coast offense. He did have timing anticipation. So that's okay. where it's weird. So that's where it gets weird. The 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 way that he played quarterback, because when he was in that offense, he did have timing and anticipation. So um, that's when it gets. It's just, last year it kind of just went away, and you know in 2016 and you, really early on in his career he didn't have that anticipation at all. So that's why that's what I'm saying the check down thing. Can't, that's where that narrative came from because right. he wasn't having that time anticipation. But with John Gruden, we really saw a development there, right? And then, then it's kind of just went back this year. So I don't know. It but probably I mean, comes. It's probably the comfort level. I would imagine. You know, changing up the offense uh, last year. I mean, the, the windows are different. He's not. Mm -hmm. He doesn't know the playbook like the back of his hand. And yeah, he'll have to deal with that if he comes to New York. You know, maybe the familiarity with Todd Downing changes things, but that's interesting. All right, I mean, the timing and anticipation—if if we learn anything from watching Zach Wilson—is probably the number one mo most important thing uh, yeah. for a quarterback to have in this offense, and that's 100%. why Tua has had so much success last year in Miami with with Mike McDaniel. All right, keep uh, going. With, before we move on quickly, yeah. do you think um, because you mentioned like the way his anticipation has kind of fluctuated? There was times where he was really good, and then this year it fell off. Do you think, despite his reputation as being a stable quarterback overall on a year-to-year -year basis throughout his career that the specific facets of his game kind of fluctuate or are a little more volatile than his overall performance might suggest you know what I mean like specific yeah. parts of his game have tended to you know based on the coaches he's working with the talent uh, despite him being stable overall in terms of you know you're getting a solid quarterback despite that do you think there's been a lot of you know, fluctuation in some of the specific parts of his game. Oh yeah. Yeah, for sure. Like there's, like I said, there's always give you some duds with him. I mean, that, that's kind of how you have to think about when you bring up, when you bring him in. And I would say with his quarterback play overall, I think that's what separates the elite guys from the non-elite guys is anticipation. I think, you know, if you watch Tom Brady or Peyton Manning or, or even Drew Brees or any Philip Rivers, any of these old guys that were, you know, great quarterbacks in this league and even some of the young guys, Joe Burrow, Patrick Mahomes, uh, you know, Josh Allen, they have high level anticipation. 
right? It's it's it's, it's it, that is what separates the Kirk Cousins from the Joe Burrows. I mean, that's what it, that's what it is. That type of timing, anticipation, getting that ball out on time. It, 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 that's the difference between the elites and the very goods, right? And you know, some guys can anticipate really well, but they don't have like the they don't have they're missing something else. But you know, anticipation is what really makes a, a quarterback great. And I think that inconsistency with Derek Carr is what keeps him from being, uh, you know, with the talent he has, a higher upper, uh, like a, a tier one quarterback. Maybe if if he got to reach the potential of his talent, that's what's holding him back. All right, deep accuracy. Okay. One to ten. You, uh, I'm gonna go eight. Eight, okay. Yeah, it was. It, I think it last would be, year's outlier. It'd probably sure. be uh, a score of eight points better than the quarterback uh, deep accuracy performance the Jets had last <laughs> last year. Okay, we can we that one go route the season, like one vertical throw along the sideline. I don't think so, right? Yeah. Um, I'm really thinking. I'm really trying <laughs> to think about a go route. Uh, oh, yeah, uh, in the against the Lions to Garrett Wilson. Oh yeah, yeah, that game we had a couple. I guess, Even I those were just Pats. like jump balls. Yeah, I guess so. he had one against the Pats too. Makes me know. miss Josh McCown's 2017 season. That's the Man. best we've gotten with deep passing. That was electric. yeah. So uh, I mean, because because with Derek Carr too, he can get really hot too. He'll, he'll get hot where he'll hit like five in a row, and he gets hot with it. So yeah, I mean, I kind of uh, I guess having a streaky quarterback, it's scary to have a streaky quarterback. I'll say that. I mean, but it's it's fun, but it's like even if you win the wild card round, then you win the division round. You're like Derek Carr's killing it. You just don't know which Derek Carr's going to show up, and that's what kind of scares me. But at the same time, he can get hot enough where he can go head toe to toe with Mahomes and Burrow and you know Josh Allen. So uh, yeah, it's, it's that's what it is, man. That's that's what that's what I can yeah. I can see the predicament the Raiders fans have been in the last eight yeah. years, where it's like this yeah. guy's good. There's so many worse quarterbacks than this guy. But he's frustrating. He's hard to replace. I would say, let, let's yes. say that because if he yeah, comes the Raiders in are probably going to downgrade. <laughs> yeah, Raiders are probably saying, downgrading if, this year. If he comes <laughs> into New York, he, he, even if you know he keeps uh, putting in ten to seven, you know seasons, right? And then you maybe get that one eleven to six or whatever. Maybe get one twelve right. and five, right? It, it's going to be hard to replace him. That's yeah. the thing with Derek. It's just like. Like well, man, he's <laughs> and I think yeah, a lot we of could Jets... move on, but who do we move on to? Right, and that's where he really puts you in. And I think a lot of Jets fans are just so frustrated with the instability at the position because it's like if you just had a Derek Carr last year, this team would make would have made a playoff run. And then I think there's always the hope too of like, okay, new situation. He's 31, you know, as he's aged in the league, you know, when he's his 32 season, is 33. He's in his prime as a quarterback. You might get that top 10 Derek Carr, and it's like you pair that with the rest of the team. You know, maybe you have that window, but the inconsistency is, is scary. Uh, yeah. One of the things I, I, I think you're going to probably give them a good grade on here, uh, play action. How do you feel? Uh, nine. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I think that that's great for, for this offense. Mike, what, are you going to say something? Oh, no, no. Oh, okay. Uh, pocket movement. And I guess we can throw mobility in here in general, but I think they're kind of different, honestly. Uh, six. Six. I will say he, he does seem to climb the pocket. Which is good. It, it, it used he, to be it was, it used to be really bad, but it's a it's better. But it's inconsistent there. Some games he'll have bad pocket presence. Some games he'll have amazing pocket presence. So yeah, yeah. Do you feel like he's a guy who has the you know this is very cliche, but they used to always say this about Sam Darnold to be like he has such an innate feel for the game. Derek Carr kind of strikes me as somebody who that might actually apply to. Uh, no, yeah. you're, no. Uh, I wouldn't say he has an innate feel of the game. Uh, I, I, I think that it, – so it's hard with Derek. I, I think Derek is kind of a smaller quarterback. I think a lot of people don't – you know, he's like 210 pounds, right? He, he just doesn't he, – he's not a fan of getting hit. And I think that's kind of a yeah. one of his, his, his biggest knocks against him too. He's just not. He's not. He's not a fan of getting hit. He's not a – he doesn't like it. <laughs> so, so, so he, I mean, he, he can take it. it. See, the thing is, like, a lot of people say he doesn't – he can't take the hits or he gets, like – he starts avoiding it, like, when he gets hit a lot. That's not true. I, I think he, he's been getting killed the past three years. So, I think he's kind of put that to bed. He still doesn't like it. So, um so I mean that's kind of the, the way I look at it, but he he's not he's not it's like he's like not afraid of it, but he doesn't like it. Got to be honest, Joe, that's, Joe, Bur Joe Burrow likes it. So. Yeah, that's that's not another red flag right <laughs> yeah, there. That's not because so, I mean <laughs> it's both not these, you want to hear. Yeah, both these young quarterbacks we just had like that's one of the main things that I'm always saying. I'm like sometimes <laughs> yeah, man, yeah. I just I'm I'm not in that pocket, so it's easy for me to say. 
But sometimes I just want you to step up and, you know, take well, that yeah, hit. And, and, and that's it. why Josh Allen is so deadly is because he's so big. You know, these hits don't affect him as much. Where you go to look at Mike White and he gets folded in half by Matt Milano. <laughs> that's, that's the one guy we did get to watch who will take some hits. But obviously to yeah. a fault, I would say. <laughs> yeah, you know, because uh, it, it can be to a fault. But that's why Derek Carr's never injured either because he, he doesn't take it. Right. So that's, he's, he's, he'll, he'll be there every week, though, because he might fade away from a throw. You know, uh, somebody hit him instead of just stepping up and taking it, he's going to fade away from it. Yeah, how do you feel about his durability? Because he obviously hasn't missed a lot of games. He does. He's had some nagging injuries at times. Uh, is that any? I mean, best ability is availability, and the Jets certainly have not. I don't think. When was the last time a Jets quarterback played every single game, Michael? Do you? Well, twenty fifteen. Patrick played every every game that year, right? But he missed most of the Raiders game. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The uh, Geno Smith his one game that year. Yeah. yeah. So then going further back, I mean, like Sanchez in Sanchez? 2011, he played, he played yeah, every Sanchez game in 2011. Right? So I think that's it. <laughs> wow. Wow. Well, all right. But you, you feel uh durability is a plus for him. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. A big time. He, he plays through injury and all that stuff. So he's, he's a, he's a tough guy. He is. It, it, it's, that's what I say. It's weird. Like he is tough, but he doesn't like to get hit. So I don't yeah. know. It's, it's hard to explain. I, it's, it's, it's a bit of weird dynamic for me to figure out. All right. What about he, Okay, okay, go, go ahead. ahead. No, 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 I'll just say that because because he'll take a hit, but he doesn't like taking the hit. But he'll take right. it. Right. I guess okay. it's like a smart balance because, like you said, there is it, it can be to a fault because Mike White definitely would have at some point it would have served him well to avoid some hits, but he went back in that Bills game and just and you know credit to him because he's playing for his life, but you yeah. know. He was taking some hits that were, you know, definitely cost him in the end. Yeah, because the Raiders fans to hate when Derek Carr, like, he'll see a sack, he'll, like, he'll curl before it gets to him. So, like, <sighs> instead of trying to get that. the ball out. <laughs> yeah, he'll curl. So, like, it protects the ball, right? And, you know, but it just looks really bad. You're just like, oh, he should have tried to, yeah. Well, anyway. speaking of, of protecting the ball, one to ten, what would you give him? Oh, uh, I'll say seven. Okay. I'll say he's pretty good at protecting the ball. The fum- the fumbles, if he's not trying to be uh, – if he's trying to be a playmaker, I think that's when the fumbles c- kind of kick in. But if I mean, he's distributing the football and playing quarterback, you won't see the fumbles as much. And, and you know, I, I think some of the interceptions, you know, I, I think it's a little over-glaring, kind of like how they are for Dak Prescott a little bit. I, I think he's still a pretty good decision maker. And then in terms of clutchness, 1 to 10. Oh. I... 10 being Brady. We're saying 10's like <laughs> – I would say nine. I'd say right, nine. Yeah. Do you think we should add like a mobility category? I guess we can combine running uh, you know, and like you know, you know, that's, outside the pocket throwing stuff like this, that. I guess so. We could just keep adding categories for the next three hours, <laughs> I guess. But even <laughs> every one of these categories, we can just break up third okay. down clutchness, fourth yeah. quarter. Uh, all right. Well, what category did you just want to add? Throwing on the move? I guess. I mean, mobility, I guess. We, uh, it's like we pocket asked. moment I, or uh, pocket movement, I guess, is you know, kind of the subtle movements within okay. the pocket. I guess we were focusing on mobility is yeah. more like, can he create, get outside the pocket and throw? Just, are you just pocket. trying to, to lower his score? <laughs> no, I don't have, an, I, I would be trying to raise his score. If yeah, they're going to run the read option. They're going to run the read option with Derek Carr. Yeah. Uh, All right. So let's, let's put in mobility. It's a okay. combination of his running skill and his outside the pocket throwing. Should we do that? Sure, go ahead. All right, mobility. So how would you, I guess, <laughs> combining all those things, how would you Mobile, raise mobility? mobility. His mobility is weird because, I mean, he has he has the mobility, but he doesn't use it when he needs to. So I'm going to go seven. I'm going to go seven there. Yeah, I see, like, his rushing numbers are very low. He doesn't do much of anything. but it, it And that doesn't seem to match up with when you watch him. Like, you feel like he's a pretty good athlete, can maybe mm-hmm. do some things. Do you think it's something he could use more often? I, I just I just think he's not just not a natural runner with the football. Yeah, that's what I think it is. Like he he, he kind of like uh, when he accelerates, he kind of like goes backwards first and then goes forward. So um, yeah, he's just not a natural runner. Um, I'm trying to picture that going backwards first and then <laughs> and then forward. Uh, <laughs> I mean, if he comes, you'll see it. I'm telling you, all these things I'm saying, you're like you can see these little quirks I point out. But uh, yeah, he at least has the mobility to pick up. You know, the the, the scrambles for oh, the first down and stuff like that. But mm-hmm. Uh, all right. Uh, you know what? I'll throw one more in here just because now we, we passed 10. So who cares how many we'll hit 13 categories. Okay. Uh, I know I'm going to say leadership. Obviously that's a blanket term, Derek Carr, 10 out of 10 leader, but in that umbrella, we're going to throw in mental toughness. 
you know, ability to handle the booze. Intangibles, that he, I guess. Inta- right. I guess that's a, yeah, ability to relate to guys in the locker room, ability to handle the media. I mean, yeah, I guess on a scale one to 10, you know, I can't, if we're going to do a Rogers podcast, I imagine Rogers will be pretty low on this. Yeah. Um, but it feels like Carr should be on the higher side of things. But yeah, where do you see it? I, I would say, uh, I'll say it's an eight because if you add in mental toughness, I'm going to take a couple notches down. Um, because, because I do think there is some, some, in, uh, instances where you know mental tough, toughness kind of just can be questioned a little bit, right. in my opinion. But um, uh, he, he is he's a great locker room guy. Everybody's gonna love him. Everybody's gonna love Derek Carr. Will, will Zach um, Wilson love him? Uh, yes, actually, that's you the think, thing. You think he would take him under his wing? Uh, yeah, actually, I, I would think Derek Carr would. If if you know, especially if Derek Carr is getting that starting job, I think Derek Carr would do a great job of kind of taking him under his wing and working with him. Um, <clears throat> I mean, because I mean, there's no no teammate has ever said anything bad about Derek Carr. That's one thing that you'll see around. I mean, even Amari Cooper said it was his favorite teammate ever. You know, he's played with like Dak Prescott, a lot of guys, right? So he said Derek Carr's his favorite teammate ever, and you never would have thought that. You know, the rumors are that he, you know, they had a didn't have a good relationship, but obviously they did, right? And you know, <clears throat> you know, he had a, he got along with Marshawn Lynch, he gets along with everybody, right? And you know, so I, I think that with the locker room and him like leading and doing things like that, and you know, getting in people's faces and and you know, telling people that when they're running the wrong routes, he does that a lot. You see that on tape. He's, you know, he's 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 pretty fiery it, during the game, and you know, trying to get people to, in the right spots and stuff like that. So I, I think he is a high level leader. It's just sometimes the mental toughness with other things uh, can can get in the way. Oh, well, looking at Derek Carr's report card, and we'll run through this. You gave him uh, every category one to ten. Arm strength, you gave him a nine. Pre snap processing, you gave him a ten. Post snap processing, you gave him a seven and a half. Short accuracy, you gave him a ten. Uh, medium accuracy over the middle, you gave him a nine, but medium accuracy outside the numbers, you gave him a four. Deep accuracy, you gave him an eight. Play action, you gave him a nine. Pocket movement, you gave him a six. Protecting the ball, you gave him a seven. Clutch, nine. Mobility, seven. Leadership slash intangibles, eight, which gives him an average of eight. Uh, it gives him one of three and a half out of, out of 130, which is a bear. I think it's barely an 80. Uh, so you'd be like, what, like an, an 80 overall in, in Madden? I feel like that's pretty accurate i mean (laughs) the ceiling is a little higher but in terms of what you're pretty guaranteed to get with Derek carr i feel like an 80 overall is is about right Mm -hmm. um and maybe he'll catch fire and you know perform like a 90 overall but that that seems about fair yeah uh do you agree with that i I think uh i I was i was hoping michael might jump in there michael does that sound uh i would say i think maybe he has 80 his best seasons could be like 85 yeah I agree with that, hundred percent. What uh, what type of salary do you think he's worth? Me, uh, I think with the salary cap going around, I think what he wants is what he's worth. The thirty five, I think that's kind of a smart um, <clears throat> number for him because I I would say like the thirty last year would have been my number for him, uh, but with the salary cap going up, like I mean, like 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 twenty percent or something crazy, whatever it went, I think thirty five is a good number for him. Definitely below like the forty thousand, uh, the forty million, and definitely for the caliber of starting quarterback he is, I think that's a good number. And do you think three year deal? I mean, obviously, I know you're a film guy, not a cap. I would guy, do two. You go two years. I would so go two. Two years, seventy million, fully guaranteed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe. I mean, yeah, I mean that would probably definitely get him to sign, but that's what I would do. I'll probably do two years just because. Just because you don't know, and then you, you kind of want your you because you kind of want to out with him just in case right. it doesn't work out. You're right. Yeah, that was the thing we were saying was it was enticing to trade for him partly because you knew you had that out after the year where it's like as if he's going to sign as a free agent, he's probably going to want more security, maybe two, three, four seasons. And it's, you know, Derek Carr, the theme of this episode is he's he's questionable, you know, he's yeah. inconsistent. And if you hit your wagon to him, you might uh, win a Super Bowl or you might be ruining the day you signed him. You don't really know what you're getting with him. Uh, I guess uh, last question. Yes. I mean, I know we've we've talked to everything Derek Carr, but a broad overview, just in case somebody fast forwarded through the entire podcast to this last few minutes. Yeah. Uh, general scouting report, sales pitch to Jets fans. I mean, just your overview on on who Derek Carr is as a player and what the Jets are getting if he's uh, their quarterback. I think what you, you are getting, you are getting a leader. You're getting a strong leader in the locker room. You're getting a guy who's going to distribute the, f- the football to playmakers. He's going to get be able to get the ball to Garrett Wilson. Garrett Wilson's going to have a big year. I think Elijah Moore will have a big year. 
Um, even this, whatever tight ends you'll have or, you know, whatever running backs you have that catch passes, they'll all have big years because uh, he's, he's he's great at getting the, the football out to his guys. It really, I think he's had a thousand yard receiver every single year for the past five years. So I think that's something that you'll notice right away is that he is a good distributor of the football. He'll be able to get the ball out to the playmakers uh, <clears throat> and he'll be able to do that consistently week to week. And especially if those guys can get open, he'll be able to do that. Uh, I think to some of it is there's there's a lot of quirks there that we, are come with it. Like sometimes if he's getting blitzed under pressure, it's not going to be the greatest game in the world. Um, you know, and then of course it's the cold weather thing. Is he going to be good in the cold weather? It's going to be an inconsistent for him too. And then of course, um, I mean, against some of the better defenses in the NFL, uh, I think sometimes he he has had the the tendency to struggle against some of those teams. So I, you know that that could become a factor as well. You know, especially when you're playing the Buffalo Bills and stuff like that. So those are some of the things you're, you're beginning. You have to think about it, but. I mean, Garrett Wilson and them boys are going to be happy if Derek Carr comes in. I'll tell you that because they're, they're, they're going to be putting up those numbers. They're going to put the Pro Bowl stuff. <laughs> yeah. they'll, be, they'll be happy for sure. They're, they're going to like Derek a lot because, like I said, every wide receiver that plays with him puts up numbers. From Nelson Aguilar to you know Henry Ruggs, Devontae Adams, uh, Zay Jones had had a you know he ended up getting twenty million because of that. Darren Waller, you know, you know he was a practice squad guy comes to play with Derek Carr. They start putting those numbers. Hunter Renfro too. So. The wide receivers are going to eat. They're, they'll have a good time over there. But uh, it just sometimes it's not going to be the greatest performance, but that's when it, he needs a good defense to keep him in the game. Yeah, for all the negatives that we've said, I have to say, you know, Jets fans are, aren't really in a position to scoff at, at you know, top-level quarterback play. I mean, you're t- we're still talking about a guy who, uh, like you said, is is – throwing the ball over the place and his receivers are going off and getting to the pro bowl. And not that that really matters that much, but considering we've watched countless jets offenses uh, where guys like Elijah Moore are underutilized or, you know, tight ends that they sign in free agency, like Tyler Conklin and CJ Uzama aren't really thrown to. And Garrett Wilson, honestly, he had an incredible season considering the, the quarterback play that he had. But if you bring in a guy like Derek Carr, he gives the, the franchise stability at the position for the first time since I guess it's Patrick in 2015. You know, I, I guess that would be fair to unfair to overlook him, but yeah. really since Pennington, like long-term three, four, five years of, of a, of a quarterback uh, of good quarterback play, top half of the league quarterback play it would be since Pennington. And yeah. even that wasn't as consistent due to injuries. So, you know, I, I, there's some red flags with Derek Carr for sure. There's some things that really do get me excited uh, about with him, and and if they do sign it, I'm sure I'll I'll talk myself into it. Right now, I would say I'm on the trade for Rogers, go for the Super Bowl. But the thing that's that's enticing about Carr is you you know you open up a, a competitive window, but it, you don't have the same pressure of all your chips have to be in these next two years, and then you're going to be in cap hell. You know yeah. you, you you can kind of build this, you can continue to build this thing gradually. Uh, Marcus, before you go, Michael, I wanted to get your thoughts just as Derek Carr podcast. Just your your last thoughts after hearing Marcus kind of go through everything. Are you feeling worse or better about Derek Carr? I think I'm feeling better, to be honest. I I think for all of us Jets fans, I think what we want to know is just can we feel good about actually getting what he's being, you know, advertised as, which is this stable guy who could come in and be this top 12 to 16 kind of quarterback who could just give us that stability and maximize good defense and a good roster and i think the way marcus laid it out it definitely has me feeling confident that he can be that guy i don't think anyone listened to this expecting marcus to pump him up and make a sales pitch he's not his agent the agent will do a great job of that i'm sure yeah. um but um we just want to know exactly what we're getting and i think being realistic that's what we're hoping to get and it sounds like that's what he is marcus thank you so much for coming on man really appreciate all your insight uh you were great talking about greg olson obviously the jets didn't hire him but yeah. Derek carr we'll see um okay. i if they don't get Derek carr i feel like they'll have aaron Rodgers. so i'm almost hoping that the uh the marcus jinx uh proves <laughs> true for two times in a row uh where can our uh where can our listeners uh find you and follow you at i mean i know you, you primarily focus uh, on the Raiders, but I've seen you post plenty of NFL content, always posting film. You're one of my favorite followers on Twitter. Uh, Thanks, where can our listeners uh, find you? Uh, at the Mark John NFL on Twitter uh, for me, and then uh, also taped online uh, on YouTube. Uh, so, I mean, I do I do breakdowns of 
all types of prospects. So you go check that out. <clears throat> so, I mean, just in case, you know, whoever you want to draft or whoever the Jets end up drafting, I might have did a breakdown on them. So go ahead and check that out on my Taped On Live YouTube. And then, uh, you know, I do a quarterback podcast too called uh, A Little Pocket Awareness. So check that out on iTunes. Uh, we talk about uh, quarterbacks every week and do some breakdowns there too. So, uh, yeah, uh, so, so, uh, so, so those are some of the places you can check me out at. So, uh, yeah. Awesome. Marcus, thank you so much. Jets fans, let us know. Comment below if you're listening on YouTube. Tweet us. If not, at CYJ Pod. Derek Carr, are you in? Are you out? Uh, I think, Marcus, you made a, at times, a convincing sales pitch. And then at other times, uh, the the red flags and the alarm bells were just going off in my head of, do not sign this guy. That's where I'm at right now. I think I'm Team Rogers, but I'm also, it's enticing. I like the, the long-term flexibility with Carr. Who knows? But uh, tweet us your thoughts. Let us know. Uh, you can follow Michael at Michael to Scronania, myself, Ben W. Blessington, uh, go to jetsxfactor.com. Best place to go for Jets content, rate, review, subscribe on iTunes. Uh, that's it. Everybody have a great week. We'll be back next Monday.